Salam and peace be upon you. I begin in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Good evening and thank you for joining. My name is Kani Sivji. On behalf of the Organization for Islamic Learning, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Ramadan lecture series. The Organization for Islamic Learning, OIL, is a charitable, nonprofit, community-based group that strives to build a membership whose main goal is to understand and practice the essence of Islam in an inclusive environment. We promote learning activities based on the teachings of the Quran and the values of its prophet and his family. We hold and participate in lectures, seminars, workshops, and retreats in hopes of enhancing the spiritual growth of our members. Today's session is the first in a three consecutive day lecture series titled Trekking for Unity, the Abraham Path Initiative, a journey towards God and each other. This lecture series explores how walking the Abraham path is both a metaphysical and physical exercise. A multi-day trek across Palestine and neighboring countries allows for greater mutual understanding between the curious explorers and the locals they meet, while requiring from its participants all the same elements we strive to nurture within ourselves during Ramadan, discipline, dedication, connection, and reflection. The Abraham Path Initiative, API, under the direction of its executive director, Anissa Methi, envisions the simple act of walking as a way for people from all over the world to connect with one another, explore together, and exchange ideas and knowledge. The API catalyzes global appreciation for the widespread traditions of hospitality that permeates in Southwest Asia. Asia. People practice hospitality in honor of the myriad acts of kindness attributed to the legendary prophet Abraham. The API helps you access that hospitality through walking. Before I introduce our main speaker to begin tonight's lecture, I'd like to invite the president of OIL's youth committee, Shahan Bahadur Ali, to say a few words about the group, which was launched in June, 2021. He will tell you a bit about their goals and objectives and the events they've held in the last year, as well as some upcoming events. Thereafter, Alicia Daya, a member of our youth committee, will read a passage from the Holy Quran. Shahan? Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, brothers and sisters. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Shahan Bahadur Ali, and I am the president of OIL's Youth Council. I wanted to take some time today and tell you what it is our council actually does. We are a branch of oil made by the youth for the youth. Our goal is to inspire and make the children in this community more engaged with and passionate about Islamic learning. We mainly do this through interactive events. Uh, for some examples of these events, we held a human rights panel where we had local speakers come in and share their experiences regarding discrimination. We had a games night where members from the community got to win some amazing prizes. And finally, our most recent event was our Eid drive. We partnered with Sakina Homes in order to supply every woman and child currently in one of their shelters a gift for Eid. I'm extremely happy to say that we did reach that goal and on top of that raised an extra $3,000. I personally want to thank each and every one of you who donated a gift or money to this event as it would not have been possible without your help. And finally, while I have the floor, I would like to promote our upcoming event, Amazing Acrylics, where we will be teaming up with Sukaina Walji Karin and hosting a class to paint beautiful Eid-inspired art. To see some of her work, you can check out her, Insta her Instagram at art underscore by underscore SWK. It will be a super fun event, and I urge all of you and your kids to join. For more information, you can see the flyer, which is on the OIL website. Thank you. My name is Alicia Dye, and I'm a member of the OIL Youth Committee. Ramadan is the month of Allah. It is the month in which the Quran was sent down as a guide to mankind. In the month of Ramadan is a night which is honorable and sacred. It is the most blessed night of Ramadan, which is known as Laylatul Qadr. 
Now I will recite Surah Al Qadr. Ozu Billahi min al Shaitan al Rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Wama adraka ma Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadri hayrum min al Fishar. تنازل الملائكة وروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتمت الفج Surely we revealed it on the grand night. And what will make you comprehend what the grand night is? The grand night is better than a thousand months. The angels in Jibreel descend in it by the permission of their Lord for every affair. Peace, it is till the break of the morning. What does Qadr mean? Qadr in Arabic means status, honor, and dignity. This night is an honorable and dignified night, and praying tonight brings much reward and blessings, as it is this night that is believed the Quran was revealed through the Prophet for his followers, the Muslims, through the angel Jibreel. The second meaning of Qadr is straightened. On this night, the earth becomes straightened for the angels to descend to earth. Lastly, Qadr means destiny. Imam Bakr salam, has said, the fate for the whole year is written in the night of Qadr. On behalf of the Youth Committee of the Organization for Islamic Learning, on this night of destiny, peace, and forgiveness, we wish you a blessed Laylatul Qadr. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Shahan. For more than 20 years, Anissa Medhi worked in mainstream American news media as a broadcast journalist and producer. She was, has won two Emmys, a CNA Golden Eagle, and numerous prizes from the Society of Professional Journalists for reporting on religion and the arts. Her credits include National Geographic, 60 Minutes, PBS, NPR, and ABC Nightly News many of our favorites. Anissa is an alumna of Wellesley College and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. She was a 2009-2010 Fulbright Scholar in Jordan. Please help me in welcoming Anissa Methi. Thank you, Kenis Zivji, for your kind introduction. Thanks also to Talib Kilbashi and Hasmein Sajan for the invitation to speak this week and for your technical support. I also appreciate the beautiful recitation of Quran by Alicia. Thank you so much and for your uh, information about Laila al Qadr. And uh, I commend um, Shahan for the work you're doing with the Oil Youth Committee. Congratulations. I'm sure you're making a big difference out there. I want to also say to our audience, I really appreciate you being here with all of us tonight in the last hour and a half before iftar. Hopefully our time together will be productive and fruitful and satisfy one kind of hunger while we wait to satisfy another kind of hunger. And I forgot to say to all, assalamu alaikum. Well, I'm a New York City girl. I grew up in Flushing, Queens, went to public school. My parents are both immigrants to the United States of America. My, my father is from Karbala, Iraq, and my mother is from Nova Scotia, Canada. They met at the University of California, Berkeley at International House where they were both students. My dad got his PhD there in uh, American constitutional law and my mom got her master's in education. Now she's the daughter of a, a Protestant minister and my dad was the son of a haji. They raised us to really appreciate the values of Christianity and Islam, which are very, very similar. Uh, we went to Muslim youth camp. We sang in a church choir. We went to bar and bat mitzvahs with our Jewish friends in the New York City uh, that we grew up in. And so we had what we would call today an Abrahamic 
kind of upbringing, although that term was not very popular when I was a kid. Um, politically, we were all Palestine all the time, and we were proud of that, but it did cause some problems. And eventually, when I went into journalism, I think one of my motivations was really to be part of the conversation in American newsrooms, to be part of the conversation about how we cover the subjects of Islam, of Muslims, and of people from Arabic speaking countries. Because from my point of view, the, the full rounded story wasn't being told. And I would say now that the silver lining of the September 11 attacks uh, on the United States really is a, a, one of those silver linings is that people like me, like you, of Muslim heritage, of Arab heritage, of Asian heritage, have decided it's important to become part of the news media and be part of the story telling. Not to convince our colleagues that we're right, but be part of the conversation. So I, as much as I loved being part of the broadcast journalism world, I'm no longer doing that. I've moved on to nonprofit leadership and I am the executive director of the Abraham Path Initiative. And so tonight I will introduce the Abraham Path Initiative to you, our project. Tomorrow night, and I hope you'll join us tomorrow too, we will deepen our understanding specifically of Ibrahim's journey and how his walk relates to our walk. And this will include conversation about the Hajj pilgrimage, on Friday, we'll conclude with looking at walking in the life of our prophet, peace be upon him. And we will also take a look at the Arbaim pilgrimage. So as I begin my formal remarks, I will say, Bismillah rahman rahim May my words reflect the intention of our, of our creator and all the mistakes I may make, I claim as my own. Why in the world have we chosen walking as a subject for a Ramadan lecture series? Well, because walking like Ramadan is part of the rhythm of our lives. And long distance walking in particular is like Ramadan, a test of endurance, commitment, self-discipline. It's a test of physical and spiritual strength. It's about keeping your word to yourself and to your family and the almighty. It's also because it's a way to connect. You know, when we walk, we connect first with ourselves, then with another, the person we may be conversing with along the way, and then with a group of people. If we're walking with a group, for example, on a multi-day hike in Jordan, which I was very fortunate to do uh, in the month of March, or if you're on a pilgrimage. Now, doesn't Ramadan also teach us to feel for others and feel with others, especially the hungry? When we're walking, we're also having an experience of others. When you walk through the countryside of Palestine, when you walk through the countryside of Sinai, you get a sense of what it must have been for Prophet Isa or Prophet Musa to be traveling in these remarkable areas and the difficulty it would have presented for them, uh, even if it might have been a bit greener then than it is now. Neuroscience has also shown that when, when you walk, you think differently. And that when you're side by side as you walk, you're jointly going to a similar goal. And the things that, that take you apart from one another may fade away. Um, we notice details about ourselves and our bodies that we may not notice in other times when we're not walking. And so it is also with Ramadan. So they say that life is a journey, not a destination. And so is the journey of Ramadan. So is the journey of walking. And so is the possibility of the Abraham path, a journey toward God, toward others, and toward ourselves. Now, I happen to love maps. So I'm going to take us on a journey through some maps that will identify some of the walking that we do as the Abraham Path Initiative and also a reminder of, 
of a, our own connection historically to, uh, to the past. So when our human ancestors walked out of Africa, when they left Africa, they began to explore the vastness of our planet. They had passage across this tiny bridge of Sinai to what is called Europe today, what is Asia today, and then eventually migrating over to the North American continent. And it's helpful when you, when you walk to know where you are, right? So we always recommend guides on the Abraham path. And we have guides spiritually as well as, uh, as, well as physically. So um, when we have our, uh, I, I, just gonna calm down here for a moment. It's very exciting for me to be presenting. Usually I'm hosting webinars. The exodus from the African continent into the rest of the world had to pass through this area. And I want to say something about this area. I imagine if I said, what do you call that area? A lot of your responses will be the Middle East. And I want to challenge that thought because where is the Middle East on the planet Earth? Here's Africa. Here's what we call Europe. Here's Asia. There's Australia. The Middle East is really a political construct. It's not a physical place. This is the Western part of Asia. When we call this area Asia, Western Asia, Southwest Asia, we're not rousing all of the, all of the political tensions, the hostilities, the things that people think about when they hear the Middle East. And so I'd like you to consider that uh, in your vocabulary. Uh, and when you hear me speak of this region of Southwest Asia, you will know what I'm talking about. Now let's talk about some of our spiritual guides at this time of year. When we think of Abraham, uh, there are many, many stories of his origins and his walking. Some say he was born down here in what is today's Iraq. Of course, there were none of these, none of these uh, national boundaries there at the time. Today's Iraq, it may have been the Mesopotamian, the Babylonian empire, pre-Babylonian. There are stories of his birth up here in South Central Turkey in the city of Urfa. So this is Ur, that is Urfa. Um, and what we've found about Ibrahim and the story of his journeys, which travel from here, the, up the Nile, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River Valley up into Turkey, and come back down through the Jordan River Valley, crossing over to Sinai where the family uh, met with Pharaoh and came home with Hagar, who was the mother of Ibrahim's first son. The story continues when God told Ibrahim to take Hagar and Ishmael to Mecca. And so there's another long walking story down to here. In Mecca, of course, Ibrahim and Ishmael together raised the foundations of the Kaaba. And we will talk more about Ibrahim tomorrow. But that gives you a sense of the vast distances that this family traveled on foot. It's humbling to me when I think about that. Let's go on to Prophet Musa. Now, the Musa story is one of born, born into bondage here in Egypt, bartering, begging, fighting, standing for freedom and taking his people across. Can you see, I, can you nod for me somebody, can you see my uh, cursor? Taking people across the Sinai where the revelation of the commandments came. And I've been studying this and it's true that many, many uh, interpreters of the rabbinic period of Judaism believe that because these commandments were given at Sinai and not in the promised land, they are applicable to all of us. That we too are recipients, inheritors, descendants of the commandments of Sinai. Then Moses came to the Eastern shores of the Jordan River and there he's, 
Mount, went on Mount Nebo and he, he died in uh, what is today's Jordan and um, uh, never made it to the promised land. Uh, but he also had a great long walk. And this picture I have here, this photograph is friends of mine walking in Sinai just a few years ago. So you get a sense of what it looked like. What was the terrain that Musa and his companions went through? We come to the story of the prophet Isa. Now, he was an itinerant preacher, an itinerant minister who was born, they say, in Bethlehem, taught up in the Galilee region, walked with his people, with his followers through this whole area, and ended up in what is today's Jerusalem. Again, walking. And the photograph I've provided for you here is what the Palestinian hillsides look like in the springtime, full of blooming poppies and other flowers. And you see the mountains in the background, which also Isa and his companions would have walked through and get a sense as you walk uh, on any of the paths that are in Palestine, but I'm going to talk specifically about the Abraham Path project, which today is called the Palestinian Heritage Trail in Palestine. Uh, this is the kind of uh, vista you'll get in the springtime. And then, of course, there is the walking life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I'm going to show you here a snippet from the film I did called Inside Mecca. Uh, for National Geographic, in which we explore the Hajj pilgrimage. And this footage is really the first time that satellite imagery of this degree, this far away, was used in a documentary film. Today we use it, call it Google Earth, everybody's very familiar with this. Uh, but this is the first time it got used, and it took my editors a very long time to get it right. So please forgive any jerkiness you may see in the video. But we are coming down here to the city of Mecca. And what do we see? Well, this part here, this is where most of the pilgrimage takes place. That's Mina and Arafat. You can see it a little bit better here, where the tent city is, where the Jamrat takes place. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow. And then if we keep on coming down closer and closer and closer, ah, there it is. There it is, you can see the Kaaba itself. This was filmed on March 8th, 2003, when most people were here, were not here, where most people were at Arafat and the crowds had left the, uh, the Kaaba itself. So that is just a sort of physical introduction to where we are. I'm going to stop my share for the moment and just talk with you for a little bit. Um, the Abraham Path Initiative pulls from the stories of these great prophets and the people who are their descendants. And my notes have disappeared from the page, so I will read from my notes and paper. There's always a backup. Um, and the descendants in this region of Southwest Asia continue to demonstrate the traditions of hospitality and kindness to strangers that their forefathers demonstrated. We just don't hear about that in the headlines. So this was the conundrum that uh, the founder of the Abraham Path Initiative, William Urey, was considering in 2003 in Boulder, Colorado, while the United States had begun its offensive against. Iraq. And their question was, how do we get out of this, forgive me for this, Mesopotamia that we've gotten ourselves into? What possible solutions can we find? And William Urey, who is the author, some of you may recognize this book, Getting to Yes, he's the co-author of, of Getting to Yes, which is one of the Bibles of negotiation. It's one of the, the reliable, most reliable sources, one of the first um, books about negotiation that isn't about domination. It's really about finding ways to cooperate. So he and his friends were sitting in Boulder, Colorado on a beautiful evening saying, what can we do to bring people back together, to reconnect us? 
And they landed on the idea of story. Story is often used in negotiation. It often it's a way to bring people to recall our humanity and forget our opposition to one another. And the story they landed on, of course, was Ibrahim's story, the origin story of the cultures of the region, the origin story of the three big monotheisms that came, that were born in that region. Although there are other monotheisms in this region as well, let us not forget, not be exclusive in the spirit of the organization of Islamic learning. So they figured Ibrahim might be able to become a unifying story yet again. Now he is, um, right now we see a lot of division, but but let's, let's give it a try. In 2006, uh, 25 people went on a Harvard study tour to see if it might be possible to walk some of these distances. And their plan was to walk from Urfa, which I pointed out to you in South Central Turkey, to Hebron, which is in, in Palestine, the city where Ibrahim and his family are said to be buried. Uh, except of course for Hagar, who is buried at the Kaaba. Uh, they walked in the footsteps as best they could figure of the legendary Abraham. Um, and along the way, they met people and they saw places and they discovered that the name of the city of his burial, Al-Khalil in Arabic, means the friend, which in Hebron, Hebron also means the friend in Hebrew. So there are these commonalities that kept coming forward, the stories, the narrations. This journey laid the foundation for the bold and hopeful project that we call the Abraham Path Initiative. It's about the development of walking trails that approximate the narrative of Ibrahim and his family. And how they shared hospitality with the people they met along the way. These stories uh, related to his family are told over and over and over again um, in the region. And I'm gonna show a short film about this journey. It was taken in 2006 and the footage again, a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit, uh, what's sort of jerky when it plays back. But we edited it recently to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Abraham Path Initiative. And it starts with a view of a reflecting pool in Urfa. Now this reflecting pool, they say, uh, it is part of the story of Abraham. King Nimrod at the time was angry with Ibrahim because he preached monotheism and polytheism was far more um, commercial and far more popular. So he wanted, King Nimrod wanted to do away with Ibrahim. So he had ordered that he be catapulted into a burning fire. But what happened when Ibrahim was thrown into this fire, they say, was God transformed the fire into a pool. And he landed in this pool safely, which of course was a miracle that brought many people to listen to Ibrahim more closely. So this little film, begins, let me see if I can share my screen again, begins with that reflecting pool and we'll take it from there. many places that are rich in history and religious significance, peoples who are hospitable. The ditch around the castle is 30th century AD, a bit on the Roman time grave. We've concluded that there's just enormous potential for greater understanding, for greater development of tourism, as a chance to really have the world see what is the true situation here in this land. Allahu Nuri wa Khalasi, fa mimman 
Exactly. So, the first thing I want to describe is this place. This is a sister. The Abraham Band Initiative is international. It affirms the dignity of all people. Saladin wrote in his diaries the following. He said, I felt like a man being led to his death when my uncle Shero asked me to come with him to Egypt. What a place. We know that peace within our hearts, within ourselves. We have just traveled all the way from Turkey through Syria and Jordan in the land of Palestine where the prophet Abraham is buried. So that's what we do today in at least a small way, we hope to contribute to peace and justice in the region. Uh, so 15 years later, here we are. Today the, new, today, the New York Times published an article it called Building the First Long Distance Hiking Trail in Kurdistan. And it details our work highlighting two of our close partners, Lawin Mohammed and Leon McCarran, a Syrian Kurd with an Irish uh, partner, and they are leading the trail scouting process. You can look that up uh, article up online. And if you'd like to know more about their process right now, right today, you can join us tomorrow on a webinar, which I will be leading at 12 noon Eastern time. Uh, and you can register for that webinar at www.abrahampath.org. And you'll hear Lawine and Lawine talking about this process of trail development and what it takes. And it really takes a lot of work so that we then can go and connect and walk and be with local guides and be with the homestay hosts and get to know one another. Our intention is to do some good to encourage meeting one another and appreciating not only what we have in common, but also appreciating our differences. Abram Path Initiative draws on the many oral histories of geographic Southwest Asia and scriptural writings and the rare historic accounts to come up with this map of, of, of where we are walking. But mostly we're interested in bringing visitors, encouraging economic development as a result of, of experiential tourism, and taking advantage of what is called slow travel, taking your time, breathing in experience and having an empirical evidence for reality, not just counting on what you see or hear in the news media. One of my favorite American writers, Mark Twain, uh, is credited with saying that a lie can make it halfway around the world before the truth finishes putting on its shoes. So we know that some of the stories about Ibrahim may or may not be true, they may be exaggerated, but they're mostly well-intentioned and they're mostly good examples for us. 
so we encourage this slow travel. API is a non-governmental organization. We are a nonprofit registered in the United States. All of your contributions are tax deductible. And we nurture and promote walking trails that are associated with the legendary travels of Ibrahim and his family. In order to emphasize this culture of hospitality, we work with local community members to cultivate walking trails. On these trails, people connect and share stories and learn about one another. Small businesses thrive. Children's horizons widen. Why? Because they're meeting internationals and they're speaking more and more of other languages, their native language as well as other languages. And friendships flourish. We draw attention to the spectacular landscapes of the region and the enduring traditions of hospitality, advancing prosperity and creating cultural exchange opportunities at the same time. And we draw attention away from the negative, which we all hear too much of and accentuate the positive, which we all know exists far more than the negative in daily life. We work with governments, communities and civil society organizations uh, to catalyze the development of trails. So far in the last 15 years, we've helped catalyze the development of 2000 miles of walking trail. There are stretches of trail in Sinai, in Palestine, in Jordan, in Turkey. And now, as I told you, in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, we are in the initial stages of trail development. More than 80,000 people have walked on legs of these trails. In Palestine from 2014 to 2018, our work was supported with a $3.3 million grant from the World Bank. And it ended up bringing additional revenue to the people who were involved in the project of $4.8 million. So it was a terrific investment of, in terms of the return that came. Our investment of expertise and training in Sinai was underwritten by a small family foundation, as is much of our work in the Sinai case, it was the Flora Family Foundation to which we owe our gratitude. We did a small trail scouting project feasibility study in Saudi Arabia in 2018. Um, we have been, as I said, catalyzing trails in Iraq. What we do is bring the technical expertise, we train guides, we do homestay, homestay host capacity building, and we bring publicity and marketing know-how to the mostly rural communities along these trails. Our mission is to nurture economic growth, cross-cultural communication and heritage preservation in Southwest Asia through community-based tourism and transformational online programming, such as is the programming of the Organization of Islamic Learning. We envision a future in which people connect through conversation and they change their perceptions and transform relationships through the simple act of walking, which means you don't really have to go very far from home in order to be walking on the Abraham path, right? The simple act of walking is conducted everywhere. In his hadith, Bukhari narrates, be in this world as though you were a stranger or wayfarer. We are that sometimes when we walk long distance. Certainly our prophetic leaders and, and spiritual guides have been wayfarers and strangers. A more contemporary turn on that comes from the American writer Joseph Campbell, who builds on that concept and says, what might make the world a better place? Campbell asks, what might make the world a better place? And his answer, tourism. Go out and meet someone new. Learn a new language, another mythology and religion. If enough people did just that, we might see the beginning of the end of demonization of other people around the world. And that's a very inspiring statement to me. If we can achieve just that at the Abraham Path and with all of us together, that would be a satisfying achievement. Our purpose is also summarized in my 
favorite Quranic passage, which will be familiar to you, 49.13. Oh, humankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples, nations, and tribes so that you may know one another. And indeed, that is our intention. I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to address any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Anissa. Um, all right, so we are going to move into the Q&A portion of our session. Again, if you have a question for Anissa, please go to menti.com and enter 92987223. So Anissa, one of the things I wanted to um, start off with and uh, I'm curious about is, do the host families or the participants that uh, become part of the walking trail have ever have any hesitation around mm -hmm. the objectives of your organization? Is there uh, any hostility that you've you've observed, or um, is it all you know open arms, which ideally I think it would be, but realistically it may not be. Very perceptive question. I will say thank you for that. Certainly. Um, we get a variety of responses, uh, Kenny's, but the approach is um, we have to go into towns and villages off the beaten path. We go to places that are often um, marginalized. They may be more conservative communities. So the idea you know, that we present is what would it be like for you if, if people came walking through your town, internationals came visiting, and sat down with you for a meal and got to know you a little bit and purchased your olive wood carvings and your olive oil and, and you know, contributed to your economy in some way or another. Would that be meaningful? Um, and the responses are, are mixed. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, both of these examples are from Palestine. So we started out talking to the men of the towns. The, the mayors and the leadership, right? Who are mostly the, uh, who have been traditionally in charge. And it was pointed out to us by a Palestinian, a young woman, a young woman who's a Palestinian consultant and said, if you wanna be bringing people to homes, you need to be talking with the moms. You need to be talking with the wives. You need to be working with the women directly. And we recognized that she was absolutely right. So we made a concerted effort to include women and you had to talk to the, their husbands often to make sure you could get to them. You ha we had to develop trust, which, we, which only deepened our relationships and only deepened the opportunities that we could have. Um, now, that was, oh, oh, then another story was there was a family uh, in the city of Araba in, in uh, Palestine that welcomed the opportunity to be a homestay host family. And this is the Mardawi family. You can find them on Facebook, my Mardawi guest house. And they, by the time before, just before the pandemic hit us, they were hosting families, you know, 300 nights a year. It transformed their lives. Their children began speaking English much better. Their computer skills were improving as the kids got older. They were meeting internationals who'd say, hey, why don't you apply for university in Dusseldorf or in Bamberg or in Paris because I can help you. And their neighbors who had initially said, gosh, why are you bringing strangers into your homes, into your home, began to observe the uh, improvements that came to their home, physical improvements, because they were making some money, and the improvements to the family and the quality of life, and approached Ayat Mardawi and said, so how do we get to be part of this? So it's a, it's a process, it's a slow process, um, and we aren't pushing where nobody, where we're not, you know, where it's not uh, welcome. We, we offer something, and if people say yes, Alhamdulillah and ahlan wa sahlan. Mm -hmm. 
So taking that a little further then from governments, are there any in particular um, that are opposing your work at all and create problems? Anything I, sort of particularly in mm, areas of occupied Palestine? Yeah, well, it's always important to have ministries and governors on your side. And as we approach our work in, uh, in Kurdistan, we have gotten to know the, the people who are, represent the Kurdistan Regional Governorate here in the United States. And we are meeting the ministries of tourism and so on in Erbil, which is the capital of Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, in Palestine in particular, it's an interesting story. We created a nonprofit there uh, to take on the responsibility of the trail because we don't we don't manage trails we don't maintain the trails we want to have that be something that the folks who live there do because they love it and it's their home and we're outsiders right so what we found particularly and and the project is welcome we, there are 330 kilometers of trail now in the palestinian heritage trail um and and people are now that people are traveling again, I think that the, the project will, and the people who work on it along the trails will greet more success. However, when the Abraham Accords were signed in the uh, late summer of 2020, uh, and the Palestinians were really uh, sidelined from that conversation, the name Ibrahim, Abraham, uh, took on a different uh, tone and organizations with the name Abraham in their name were uh, non grata, shall we say. So that provided a uh, problem for us we hadn't anticipated. And that's why the Palestinian Heritage Trail uh, changed its name from the Masar Ibrahim, the Abraham Path, to the Palestinian Heritage Trail. Now they did it under duress, but I think it's a great thing that they did because Palestinian Heritage Trail says a lot more about what that trail is than does Masar Ibrahim. Abraham Path is a wonderful concept. You know, the walking in the footsteps and rejoining, uh, uh, reconnecting with this, with this wonderful family of hospitality. But um, the trails on the ground need a different name, Palestinian Heritage Trail, the Sinai Trail, the Jordan Trail. And we don't know yet exactly what the trail in Iraq may be called, but it could be the Zagros Mountain Trail, which is also a geographic designation. The northern part of the Zagros Mountains are up in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Okay. Um, so are the varying national trails that are part of the API actually linked currently? Meaning are they interconnected? Um, and is it possible to walk through these uh, countries of the region? Well, we have a 200 year plan, you know, so by 200 years from now, we expect that the borders and boundaries and limitations placed on walkers will have, will be different. Right now, it's, it's absolutely impossible to walk uh, from Palestine to Jordan. You simply can't. Mm -hmm. It has to be in a bus or a car or a taxi or something. Um, I walked across the Allenby Bridge when I was a kid, um, but you can't walk across the Allenby anymore. So, so no, these are not physically connected trails. Uh, and they are not really, um, they are independent trails. They're not Abraham path trails, although we gave birth, we are the you know, sort of birth mother, but these are, these are, 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 are independent trails that are self-managed and we're available to provide expertise and uh, to send walkers and to help them in any way we may. But, um, but you would want to see, you'd want to go to their own websites uh, to, to know more about those, those trails. Um, if you remember the maps I showed you and I said that the, those geographic borders didn't exist at the time of Abraham. Well, if you look at the borders of Europe, they've changed a lot over the last one or 200 years. I don't know how these borders are gonna change or if they will, but it is altogether possible that the land will remain and the people will remain and the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee and the Zagros Mountains, but there may be other 
geopolitical configurations and that may allow people to walk from one place to another. If you think back to the Ottoman Empire time, people didn't have to show a passport to cross from Iraq to what is now Turkey to Syria, for example. Okay. And what's your work been with the national governments of these countries? Have they been open? Have you done communications with them? What, what's the resistance been? What's the facilitation been like? Have they contributed? What they are recognizing and what they've been recognizing all along here is that there are trends in tourism off the bus and onto the ground. And that's worldwide. That's just a trend in tourism. And the idea that there may be ways to encourage walking tourists to come to their country and experience their culture and see the wonderful historic sites that are there and begin to appreciate the, the, the food and the hospitality. Uh, and the greatest resource, which all of these places have, which is their, their residents. Um, they're very excited about seeing that happen. And each country has its own particular complications, its own particular op opportunities. Um, you know, if you're working with Bedouin in Sinai, they might say, we're not ready to work with the Egyptian government, but then they'll say, oh, we've just been recognized by the Egyptian government. So things, things are always in flux. It's a, it's a, it's a moving, a moving celebration, a moving, movable feast at all times. But mostly we get very, we, there is a warm reception. For example, the Kurdistan regional government is interested in diversifying its economy away from dependence on fuel, on fossil fuels. And the two areas that they're looking at to move into are uh, agriculture, because that is the breadbasket of Iraq, really, in that fertile area of Northern Iraq, agriculture and tourism. So there's a real, uh, a big welcome sign there for us. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you spoke about female participation and reaching out to the women of the communities to um, participate. Are there many female guides associated with the API? Great question. Love it. We did a webinar in March, which was International Women's Day and uh, Mother's Day in some countries and, and Women's Month in the United States. And we had a female guide from Palestine on that program as a guest. And she said, look, it was tough for me at first. My family, I always wanted to be outside. And my family was saying, you know, that's not how girls do it. And she was saying, well, in her own way, she was saying, watch me. And so she got certified as a guide. She is not only certified as guide. This is uh, Warud Sharabati. She is not only a certified guide. She does spelunking. She does caving. She does climbing and she has the intention of being the first uh, woman from the West Bank to summit Mount Everest. And had it not been for COVID, she probably would have done that already. We have an intention absolutely to train uh, women guides in the Kurdistan region in that project. And there are increasing numbers of female guides in Jordan is what we've, we've learned now because the people we trained are now training the next generation of guides. So yes, it's very important. In fact, where did I read it? Just, just now there was a comment, oh, in Kurdistan, that's right, in the, in the article about the organization's work in Kurdistan. The, 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 um, uh, the need to have, the need to have female guides so there can be women only walking groups that can, can tra travel and walk safely with a, with a, with a guide. We have another question. Um, have you been able to connect Israeli and Palestinian leadership through this project? No, <laughs> but neither is that our intention. Okay. We are not a, we are not a peace building organization. Although if peace were one of the emerging outcomes, we would be delighted. We provide the space for people to go and have that experience of connection, of conversation, of walking shoulder to shoulder in the same direction where you're, you, you physically have a different experience of the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, we know this from uh, negotiation theory. Uh, but we have not 
gone and said to Israeli and Palestinian leaders, why don't you come and walk on this trail together? No, we have not. That's not how we see our role. Okay. Can people who are interested in walking the various trails in the region join a group or join with others, or is this an individual um, adventure? Great question. Uh, we always recommend that you work with either a tour operator to have your, your journey be the journey you're looking for and to hire local guides. You may walk independently in some of these places, but you, if you go to the website of the Jordan Trail or the, Palis or the Siraj Center, for example, in Palestine, um, you will find um, that there are tour operators that you can go to directly who will be able to manage your experience. And they often have uh, groups they're waiting to fill and they often have, uh, sometimes they're daily for the people who live in the region, um, weekend walking trips, and you can join groups that way. What we have found is that many more people who live in these countries, in Jordan and Palestine and so on, are beginning to enjoy the culture of walking. It's not so much or exclusively internationals anymore that are participating in these programs. So go and find yourself a door operator and sign up. And we can help you find a tour operator if you can't find one yourself, www.abrahampath.org. Okay. Happy to help. Okay, so we are just about at the top of our session. Um, if there are any questions that you had that weren't answered, we will certainly try to get to those uh, tomorrow. On behalf of the board, it's with gratitude that I extend my appreciation to all of you listening live or to the recording. If you'd like to learn more about the Abraham Path Initiative, like Anissa said, please visit abrahampath.org. And if you'd like to support the API and Anissa's team's work throughout, this, throughout Southwest Asia, please click donate on their website and see the many ways you can help build bridges in a world longing for connection. To our speaker, Anissa, we are grateful for your time, for your inspiration, and for your work to spread the true essence of Islam. Lastly, events like this are only possible through your donations. Please consider a small donation through OIL's website, islamiclearning.org. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening. See you then. Have a wonderful iftar.